So today, I know in Washington, D.C., there's uh, lots of eulogies going on for our 41st President of the United States, George H.W. Bush. Um, and today I want to do a kind of a, of kind of a eulogy, too, for a completely different sort of character. Um, I want to recognize the monk, Venerable Paulin Gyatso, who died on November 30th. He died a few days ago. Um, there's no big story about him on the lion's roar. I'm quite surprised. Um, or any big you know, newspaper. But he um, was an extraordinary being, and he had a very particular effect on my life personally. He says here, he claimed he had no claims to being an ordinary monk. He said, my story is not a glamorous one of high lamas and exotic rituals, but of how a simple monk succeeded in surviving the destructive forces of a totalitarian ideology. So Venerable Paulin Gyatso's claim to fame, if you will call it that, is that he survived for 33 years imprisoned in Tibet by the communist Chinese. He was starved, beaten, forced to work, repeatedly tortured, um, and he was finally released after 33 years, not because of the kindness, kindness of the Chinese government, but because of the work of NGOs and human rights organizations that worked for nine years to get him out of prison. And then he escaped to Dharamsala. Um, he smuggled along with him some of the instruments of torture that had been used on him in prison. And then he made it his mission to speak about his experience. Uh, and so he spent the rest of his life traveling the world, um, telling the story. I heard him in person in uh, 1995. It looks like that was the time that he came to North America. I don't know how often he came back. Um, but it is one of the most, imp he was, his, meeting him was one of the important influences that make me a Buddhist nun. Um, that's one of the important conditions for me to be sitting in this seat right now. So, um, of course, there are many conditions that had to do with that meeting. Um, Venerable Tipton Children was teaching at Dharma Friendship Foundation in Seattle, and a small group of students supported her to be living there. My friend had become her student and had been invited me to this early morning talk with Venerable Paladin Gyatso. As I was, recall, he was passing, really literally passing through Seattle from Vancouver on his way to something else. And so the only time they could have this presentation was at 7 or 7.30 in the morning so that people could go and hear him speak before, you know, before they had to go to work. So at that time, uh, Dharma Friendship Foundation was meeting in this little house off of Green Lake, which is where Venerable also lived. And um, so I remember coming into the living room. The crowd wasn't very big, maybe 12. 15 people, I don't know, something like that. Um, and he was sitting in the corner, as I recall, this is a long time ago now, but um, sitting, in the, sitting in a corner seat, I don't remember who translated for him either, but he was this small kind of wizened body, you know, very small man. I now realize that he was much younger than he looked at that time. Um, sitting there in utter serenity, so I took a seat, I was on the floor, I was maybe five feet from his left toe. And uh, he be Venerable Children gave him a nice intro, and he began to talk in a um, very gentle, matter-of-fact voice, just matter-of-fact. And he talked about things that were atrocious, utterly horrifying, utterly unbelievable. It all started when um, a day in 1959 when the um, Chinese had, had already invaded and they had, um, had invited the Dalai Lama, His Holiness, to come to a um, dance troupe performance. They had said, don't bring any guards, don't bring any people, you must come alone. I've always thought that was kind of stupid. <laughs> Wouldn't you guess something was amiss? <laughs> Well, a whole bunch of Tibetans did, and um, they went to the Potola, and uh, Palin Gyatso was among them. There became quite a big crowd of peaceful protest wishing to protect His Holiness. That blew into a big confrontation with the Chinese Communist Army, 
And um, at that very moment, then, he, Heldon Gatso, was taken prisoner for the first time, and that began his 33 years of imprisonment. He became a monk at the age of 10 in his local town, and then he got a seat at Drepung. So he was near Lhasa at that time. Um, and he said that he wasn't really a scholarly monk. He'd only really been able to study for eight years. But it was the Dharma that supported him throughout this whole 33 years of his life. He talked about the starvation. This story, I just saw this story that so was vivid in my mind. He said that from 61 to 63, there was a big famine in Tibet. So, of course, the prisoners were starved too. He said some of the prisoners would eat the bones of dead rats or insects that they found in the field. I soaked my leather boots in water and began to chew on them. And soon there was nothing left. He said, I would say 70% 70 of the prisoners died during that time. He talked about having witnessed numerous executions. He talked about the work, um, work field, you know, working in the fields. He said we had to work like animals. We were treated like animals. So we, we worked. Um, he talked about being tortured numerous times, not just beatings, but with electric batons being stripped naked, electric cattle prods being used all over the body, including in your mouth. But the nuns, he said, were raped with the electric paddle, cattle prods. He lost all his teeth um, from the electric cattle prods in his mouth. Although, he said in 1992, when he went to England, Amnesty International gave him dentures so, for the first time. So the stories were vivid. His pain about them was so tangible, I mean, clearly. And yet, sitting just a few feet from this man, the wave, the aura of love about him was, it was palpable. It was so, there was such a huge disconnect between the things he was saying the stories he was telling. You knew they were coming from his bones, they were so true. And yet, there was absolutely not a shred of anger. Not a shred of hatred. Of course, he was speaking Tibetan, so I didn't, you know, I couldn't get the words exactly, but you could hear it in his voice. It was just such a matter of fact presentation. So when he was speaking, he, he basically said the same thing. He was not there to teach bodhicitta. He was there to tell the story of what was happening with the Chinese communist occupation of the Tibetan people, to let the world know so that the Tibetan people could be freed. But then, he, I'm quoting from an Oslo Freedom Forum statement that he made in 2009, but he basically said the same thing at this little talk at Seattle in 19... 1995. I don't feel hatred toward the Chinese. I don't feel like I want to seek revenge. I'm still alive. I didn't die. I don't feel angry at all towards the Chinese. I want to make this very clear because even though I'm a novice in terms of Buddhist studies and practice, even from the basics of Buddhism, I know about the principle of compassion. So I think there's no point in feeling angry or hatred toward the Chinese government for the way they treated me. I cannot respond to negative actions with my own negative actions. This will not be of benefit to anybody. This will only lead to more negative actions, lead to disagreements and to fighting. So this is just my point of view, my experience the way I think from basic Buddhist principles. It's not something I'm just saying. I really feel it's important to not to feel hatred, not to feel anger. After 33 years of suffering, 33 years in prison, that's what I've been able to learn. I was able to practice my religion. So in my own Dharma practice, you know, sometimes I really try to make myself reflect on horrible conditions like this. Just to, I don't really want to do this, 
but I kind of make myself, you know, if I were in a situation like this, how would I be? How would my practice be? Or, um, you know, when we were um, celebrating, we were commemorating last, a few weeks ago, people went to the synagogue to the, to, you know, we were talking again about the um, Holocaust survivor and her, her talk. You know, if I had been herded onto that train and then, you know, taken into the Nazi concentration camps, how would my mind have been? If I had been interned as a Japanese American, how would my mind have been? If I was a black mother today and my child was shot for no good reason in the back, how would I feel today? You know, how, how would I feel? How could I apply my practice to that situation? So at the end of Paolin Gatso's talk, what I remember is if this spiritual practice can do that to that man, I need to know what it is. And it took a while for it to really settle into me, but I really think that was the moment when I understood that there was something so powerful in the Buddhist teachings that an ordinary man, monk, could sit in front of a group of little Seattleites in the early morning and talk about such atrocious, atrocious things and have no hatred, no anger, and just radiate love. It was unbelievable. So there was a couple, there was a very moving story I wanted to share. This was in an interview, somebody interviewed him in the Tibet News last December Ask him, um, what, after you got out, why did you go around the world to continue your activism? You know, he's been everywhere. What made you do that? And he said, I made a promise. He went on to describe an intimate relationship with one of the eight men with whom he had at one point shared a cell. The man was begging for water. After being repeatedly denied any by the guards, Gyatso, who repeated the motion for me as he told the story, moved his tongue around to produce enough saliva to pass to the man. After being relieved of his thirst, the man asked Gyatso to one day, if he survived, please do something for Tibet. After making this request, the man passed away. Alden Gyatso had it in his mind that he would never cease fighting for the freedom and human rights of Tibetans should he ever reach sanctuary. And that is the promise and is why he made a point to travel, to tell his story, and bring the world's attention to the cause of Tibet. So I found a lovely little poem uh, by a Tibetan poet, Sering Woser, pardon my Tibetan, where she writes, there was only on the web I saw, spread out before an old lama, an array of handcuffs, leg irons, daggers, electrified de- batons that can be put to various uses. He had a hollow face with wrinkles like ravines, but you could still make out the splendor of his youth. And a beauty not of this world, For when he left home, still a boy, he had to sublimate his outward charms to the energy of Lord Buddha. So he did have a beauty, not of this world, a real presence of love and compassion and embodiment of compassion in a way that was certainly my experience of this man, who I knew for an hour, whose life was so, um, has affected so many people who experience so much. And I think that we have the holy, precious dharma we have because the Tibetan people have suffered so much. Had they not, we'd still all be sitting in Episcopal church or hanging out at the bar or wherever we'd be on a Sunday without the dharma, you know? So much. And so I feel great fortune for all the conditions that brought me to that moment to be able to recognize just like the living proof of the power of this teaching. Um, May no one ever have to experience what he did. No one. 
And of course, he says over and over, this happens all over the world. It's not just Tibet. We all have to join together to make this. But uh, I want to, to really honor the life and death of Paldin Gyasso. I think he had stomach cancer or something. Anyway, he'd been taken care of at the Kirti Monastery in Dharamsala for many years um, and guy, died at the Gaelic Hospital there. So I'm grateful, and I wanted to make this tribute to him today. <laughs>